The original Resident Evil 2 is one of the most iconic horror games of all time. It was released back in January of 1998, and in November of 2009, we got to replay the events of RE2 in Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles. And of course, as you all know, Resident Evil 2 was remade and released in January of 2019. Why do I bring this up? Because by now, we have seen Resident Evil 2 in its classic 3D polygons with fixed camera angles, we got to replay it in an arcade shooter style, and now we got to experience it with today's realistic graphics in a third-person shooter gameplay. And yet, we are still demanding for Resident Evil 1.5. In case you haven't heard of 1.5, the developers of the game were dissatisfied with the results of the product, so rather than releasing the game since they had pretty much completed it, they actually decided to scrap it all and start from the very beginning. Some of the aesthetics and sceneries were omitted including Elsa Walker, the original Claire Redfield. Some characters remained similar to their official appearance, and the game's story would have some changes as well. The game that started out as the prototype to Resident Evil 2 has had fans exploring every aspect of its gameplay reveals, and even some have tried to bring it to life by modding Resident Evil 2. I myself have tried a few versions, but unfortunately, they haven't had much luck completing the game or fixing all the bugs and glitches. Nevertheless, the experience of exploring these prototype locations was still wonderful. I love seeing how dedicated fans can get when they work with what they got. But let's take a look at the trailer reveal of the prototype of Resident Evil 1.5. Take a good look at the appearance of the enemies. The zombies look different, but I think they redesigned them in the final version because the zombie models looked very similar to the zombie models in Resident Evil 1, which looked very blocky. I think what makes Resident Evil 1.5 a unique game of its own is that it has everything we love about the original Resident Evil games, and it's almost like a complete what-if scenario. And you know what? Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City was a what-if scenario game. So why couldn't we get Resident Evil 1.5 if that too is basically a what-if scenario game? I still want to play 1.5, the prototype version, not a remake with today's graphics or a modded version of RE2 even if it's complete without bugs, mainly because I want to know the exact story that was presented with the prototype version, and only those who worked on the game know what the original story was like. And why not a remake version of 1.5? because there's something admirable about the classic 3D polygon graphics. I think that they make terrifying enemies look even scarier than most creatures with realistic graphics. Maybe it's because of how abnormal they look, just like pixelated sprites. I've seen some of the most horrifying looking creatures come from a number of pixels. It's art. I love it. It's why I always go back to playing the classic RE titles, even though their remakes are just as good as the classics. And after re-watching the prototype trailers, it still looks like its own game. And it is its own game. We still don't have a clue what exactly happens in 1.5. There are so many changes made including with the characters and storyline. Leon and Elsa start their journey in a completely different location. We've never seen these zombie models in any Resident Evil game before. William Birkin's Tyrant appearances aren't the same either. There are some enemies that were removed and never included in any of the Resident Evil games, which is something I really wanted to see in the remake of RE2, as they would have made the game even scarier than it already is. Thanks to the Man Spider. I bet there was a diary of a victim who became a Man Spider and described how it started until his very last moments. Or maybe two police officers were attacked and one of them got infected, and after they locked themselves in a room at the police station, one of them describes every symptom and side effect that occurs over time, up until the moment his partner becomes a man spider and kills him. 
You see what I mean? Your imagination runs wild with countless theories as to how something that was scrapped was meant to play out. If you need more information about the cancelled creatures from Resident Evil 2, including others from separate RE titles, be sure to check these three videos out. You'll be surprised to see just how many potential enemies were never released. Let's see. There were also different weapons included with 1.5 such as throwing grenades, something I'm glad to see was added to the remake. They also included one of my favorite features in any game, battle damage. If a zombie grabbed a hold of you, they could tear through your outfit. I have no idea why they removed this feature since it was an improvement that was regrettably never added. Even though the game takes place in the same locations as the final version, they still have a completely different appearance. I'm a fan of the fixed camera angles and pre-rendered backgrounds, and to me, these pre-rendered backgrounds are like paintings. They're full of obscure details that mix well, giving it realism with the right amount of lighting. Everything is detailed and visible enough to give off an unnatural vibe, and I'm always wondering what's beyond certain backgrounds. Let's observe these for example. This is a pre-rendered background that was originally meant to be included on Resident Evil 2, but they went with a different angle shot in the final version. But let's look at multiple shots from this exact location. They're all great, but the prototype shot is the most appealing in my opinion. Simply because if you look behind the burning vehicle, you can see a dark path up ahead, which leaves you wondering what's beyond the dark path. I'm so curious that it leaves my imagination running wild. Perhaps the flames on the vehicle became an issue to work with, so they went with a different angle. Or maybe a few zombies were going to be roaming from a far distance. There has to be a reason why this shot wasn't used when it's the most appealing pre-rendered background when compared to the shot in the final version. Here's the operations conference room in the police station. What do you see? Can you describe what happened? I'm sure it's difficult to do so since you probably have multiple theories as to what went on the last time this room was fully occupied. Now look at these. The artists put so much effort into each of these backgrounds that they could even tell a story. This is why I'm always looking forward to reading any notes or diaries left behind, because they'll most likely explain what happened there. So those were the reasons why Resident Evil 1.5 is still demanded up to this day. Capcom basically still has a new game they haven't released, and even if it's not 100% finished, it couldn't be a problem adding the necessary touch-ups to fully complete it. The Resident Evil 2 remake was by all means a great remake. I love how it turned out. There are some things I didn't like, which I'll explain in a separate video review, but we know what happened in Resident Evil 2's storyline, and what we want to know is how the Raccoon City outbreak occurred in the prototype version. Who was Elza Walker? What was Robert Kendo's original role? Was Officer Elliot Edwards supposed to have additional scenes and his own character model? Was the final boss fight against Golgotha far tougher than the final version of Birkin's final form? Who was originally going to survive by the end? We'll never know. Unless Capcom can honor us with just one final DLC feature for the Resident Evil 2 remake and give us Resident Evil 1.5, we'll even buy it at a high price. Or you could just give it to us for free like you did with the Ghost Survivors DLC pack. That was a fantastic surprise. We thank you for your generosity, Capcom. But please, give us Resident Evil 1.5. Quick announcement, everyone. Recently, YouTube's algorithm has been updated to only bring traffic to channels that are constantly uploading daily, which means that only the mediocre corporate channels such as WatchMojo, pointless vloggers, and those who have already made a huge following will be safe from this corrupt website. Channels with hardworking creators such as this one that are struggling to make ends meet will be ignored and the only content on YouTube will be nothing but trash content except for the lucky few who have already got a large following. YouTube has not only made it harder for subscribers to be notified when their favorite creator recently uploaded a new video, but now even viewer engagement is becoming another issue. The algorithm detects certain words from comments and will automatically put them on the spam folder. And if I approve the comments on the spam folder, YouTube will think that I'm trying to go against his rules and regulations and punish me for giving you freedom of speech. Heck, they're still talking about removing the dislike button just because they don't like harsh criticism every time they screw up. Big companies hate when the people speak up and criticize their work or product, so they'll try to shut you up even on my YouTube channel. Here is why I want you all to join my Patreon. See, on my Patreon, it's more than just extra content without censorship. It's our domain. Sooner or later, this channel will be taken down simply because I'm against their censorship, and when that happens, I'd like to know that my Patreon has everything from my channel, including extra content, and a hell of a lot more. 
Just by donating a single dollar, you will get instant access to all my content including never before seen videos that could not be featured on my YouTube page. You will also get to see newer videos one week earlier than when they're posted on my YouTube page. You get access to my Patreon only feed, you get to see your name on the outro of every new video, and you can even send fan art that'll be next to your name on the outro of new videos. Yeah, all this for only donating one dollar. Most channels would prefer putting these reward tiers as their $5 or even $10 to $20 donation rewards. But I want everyone who supports the channel to get all these rewards, even if you're only donating the smallest amount. Because this is how much of a difference you are making when you're supporting my channel. Your donation means so much and you deserve so much for your contribution. For the bigger donations such as the $5 tier rewards, you'll get everything from the $1 tier rewards as well as commentary videos on my work like describing how I put together the Birkin vs Nemesis fights and you can also get featured in a new video by taking a short video clip of yourself telling me which video is your favorite and what future videos you're looking forward to. Then for the $10 tier rewards, you get everything from the $1 to $5 tier rewards and you get to choose what video you'd like to see next. Also if you have a PS4 or a Switch, let me know your gamer tag and we can join teams on whatever games we both have. If you have any questions, just send me a message on my Patreon and you'll immediately get a response from me. So with that said, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, share and subscribe if you haven't. But most importantly, be sure to turn on notifications because YouTube won't bother to do its job even if you're subscribed. If you're a Patreon supporter, check out the exclusive videos on my Patreon. Go support the channel which is only a dollar. Sacrifice that McChicken for extra quality content my friend. But anyways, I'll see you on the next video, and remember to have an awesome day.